Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Robinson, or the Playtyper guy, as my son has described me. Um, I'm very excited to have uh, Jasmine Joshua here with me. Um, they are the uh, writer, actor, performer out in Seattle, uh, Washington, um, and the artistic director and um, of the Reboot Theater, which I believe uh, Jasmine found it while pregnant with their twins. That is that true. Is <laughs> uh, I was hard, I was nowhere near that um, efficient <laughs> when my <laughs> and I wasn't even doing any of the heavy lifting. I was just there and trying to, you know, um, be supportive <laughs> and prepare for being a dad. But uh, thank you, uh, Jasmine. So, can you tell the folks about uh, what you do, your work and your, your art and kind of your own way. Cause I think it'd be interesting for them to hear. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, uh, the founding artistic director of reboot theater company. Um, our mission is to test new interpretations of established work through non-traditional uh, casting design and methods yet to be discovered, which gives us a very large loophole, which is has been great. <laughs> um, and yeah, well, basically, essentially what we do um, as we've like, that has always been the mission and that has always been what we, what our focus has been. But I think that um, as we have settled into ourselves and we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary, which is wild, um, we basically are queering the canon. <laughs> That's kind of what it's ended up being. But we we basically take a look at, um, as I mentioned, established works, and we mostly do musicals. And we look at how um, how context. At what point does context break the story? So. When we, the first show that we did was 1776 and we did, we produced, um, it was actually the first in the country. I'll mm. take that feather. Um, <laughs> as well you show. should. Yeah. It was the first all female 1776 full production because there had been concert versions, but no one had ever done a full production um, before. And we did it in uh, 2015. Um, and at the time it was all female, although since then a couple of us have come out <laughs> as non-binary. So, um, which makes total sense because, you know, it was a nice chance to play a different gender in a way that was taken seriously. So, um, I mean, I've said, you know, since I have come out that like one of the most rewarding, I've never felt more myself on stage than when I was playing a man in heels. So... <laughs> And yeah, so, you know, so we did 1776 um, and, you know, for years afterward, people were like, man, you know, after the first five minutes, it did not occur to me that you all weren't men. Like, I just didn't think about it anymore. And I thought, OK, so if you can watch a stage full of people who are not white cis men who we know as I mean, as far as we know. Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and, uh, you know, John Adams, all of these people were white cis men. So this is reality. And if you are able to transcend that and still understand the story and still know what's going on, well, what else? Mm -hmm. Like if I could do that with Ben Franklin, <laughs> and that's, why not um... Harold Hill, right? Why not, you know, Audrey, mm -hmm. why not Sweeney? Why not anyone? Absolutely. And, and that's an interesting point. Um, so, in your sense, you are, these are women playing or women presenting, Absolutely. playing um, mm -hmm. male characters. They are playing, mm -hmm. and then it's the intent is to perceive them as male. The reason I ask that is because mm -hmm. something that's interesting about Hamilton was right. that Thomas Jefferson is black. Mm -hmm. Like that is, and, and it's sort of, if you look on YouTube and you see uh, white actors sometimes play, and it's adorable. I love that you tried. But you know, my like it's, <laughs> yeah. and I say that with a bit of spice as someone who, yeah, um, when um, in local theater and off theater beyond, there's been that acceptation of where okay, well, we'll cast a black actor as um, you know, Mr. Darcy in our otherwise yeah. very, 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 very English production of Please. 
pre and the expectation is that you're going to be, you know, Colin Firth. And that oh. sort of this, well, you know, putting this hand behind your back, whatever your experience mm -hmm. and whatever, you're not able to, oh, sure, you can be in Glenn Gary and Ross, but give us as mm -hmm. much Al Pacino, Liev Schreiber as you can, which is just, okay, well, I'm kind of now having to play something that is not me or close to me. And so that was sort of, um, but in this instance, it's not sort of like, play it as a woman or play it however you bring to it or is, or, or is that not the case It's more of just sort of play what you feel is authentic to who they are or how would you describe that when you're we actually out? have a full spectrum of that because i think mm. the different pieces require different reboots require different interpretations of that so you know for so 1776 we did i suppose what would be called gender blind in the sense that like i did i was john adams i did not play john adams as at the time a woman i didn't even play john adams as a non-binary person i just mm -hmm. played john adams we i dressed as a man would in the time and uh, uh, you know for all intents and purposes it was a very traditional production of 1776 we didn't do anything wild beyond the fact that we weren't the gender of the characters. Um, you know, actually our Martha Jefferson, like we, like, uh, um, I forget, well, I don't remember Lisa's last name, but Lisa, uh, you know, my friend Lisa played Martha and she is Jamaican. And we kind of did that a little bit on purpose to the sense of like, yeah, <laughs> like that was our kind of tip of the hat <laughs> so to, speak, <laughs> to the fact that Thomas Jefferson is, and well, was kind of a friggin' pig. Um, so, um, and that like, there's the, anyway, so point being like, we, um, not that, uh, 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 and, but we didn't, we, but we did not acknowledge that in the show. Like there wasn't a moment where the show was self-aware in the sense that we were like, let's discuss like that Thomas Jefferson owned people <laughs> <laughs> while he was spouting all of this anti-racist you know, rhetoric that he stole from other people, but he did not live that. And he, you know, was, yeah. So we didn't really acknowledge that in that show. I think that, you know, for our first at bat, um, we did not get to that level of ambition. Um, however, in other shows, like we just did 110 in the shade. And in that production, we acknowledged the genders of the actors as their characters and the only way that show as far as i'm concerned our reboot would have worked if is if we had done that so for example we had a trans woman play lizzie who is the lead character in that show um and generally 110 in the shade if you're not familiar is the story of it makes me like wince to even say it is the story of a woman who thinks she is ugly is told she is ugly by every man in town and then it's it's a set, it's the musical version of the rainmaker, right? So then a stranger comes to town and is like, "You're not ugly," and she's like, "You're right." <laughs> End of story. That is essentially the plot of this musical. So when That's I read this script, I was like, "It could use some help." <laughs> why? First of all, why? I mean, in general. But then I started thinking about it. So if I, we had just done like, yes, and anyone can play anyone, I'm like, yes, I suppose anyone can feel ugly, and that is true. And the more that I thought about that, I was like, okay, so Lizzie's biggest and Lizzie's biggest dream is she wants to get, she wants to be a wife and she wants to be a mother and she wants to be like a traditional quote, like Western traditional woman. That is important to her. Those are what her I want songs are about. That is what she's trying to get. And what she's stopped by is the fact that she feels that she's told she is ugly and she says she is ugly. So now I'm thinking, okay, what kind of women are told that they are ugly and that they can never have a traditional marriage and then they can never be mothers and that they are ugly? What kind of women is that denied to? So I was like, well, trans women, right? And so as an audience, when I see a trans woman who is like, I just want to live a simple, quote, normal life. That is what I want. And mm. now I'm rooting for that as an audience member, especially mm. a Seattle audience member. 
you know, like now this is a story where, and what's incredible is that, um, again, this is a, it's a kind of a rare show. The father, Lizzie's dad in the show is like probably one of the like, most progressive supportive fathers in the musical theater canon which is incredible because he is rooting for her he's like you know what like you are beautiful and there is no one that can tell you that you're not and you should have everything that you want and her one of her brothers is like why are you lying to her and the father's like i'm not lying to her so it's like this really beautiful it just becomes it opens the show oh, wow. the that it is not if That's you were quote, incredible that's right? incredible. Like the ability to take here's what make here's what the story is actually about, right? And how we can make it make sense um, right. in this in this time. That's really uh, and, exciting. So like, and that's the context, right? Mm -hmm. The context has changed. The story has not. And that's what reboot is about. And that's what we do. And there are certain things that, like, um, I'll give you one more example. We did Sweeney Todd. And yes, it was essentially a it was a gender and colorblind cast in the sense that the identities of the actors playing the characters did not influence uh, um, the story. Like we didn't. So, for example, we had a non-binary Sweeney Todd. We had a black Joanna. We had an Asian beggar woman and um, and our, uh, our our Sweeney was white. So spoiler, that family trio was not real because those three people could not have biologically made that family but it didn't matter like we didn't we we ignored that however in the story of sweeney todd the the um the villain of the story the judge he lusts after sweeney's daughter who is a young girl and it's this very disgusting pedophilic and that that's the danger of like is the judge going to get this girl and i said to the director i said look we can do gender blind and colorblind that is fine however let us be aware that the audience sees what the audience sees we can say it's quote blind but it's real because we're looking at it so i said under no circum i said you can cast whoever you want as joanna if you cast a white woman as Joanna, which is okay. In no world can you cast a man of color to be the judge. Mm -hmm. Because what the audience is going to see is a man of color going after a little white girl. Regardless of whether or not that is the intention of the show, regardless of whether that's the direction of the show, we can say all we want, mm -hmm. like, we didn't mean it. It doesn't matter. We're looking at it. So like, those are the things where like, when I say gender blind and colorblind, I think that you know, people get like Ugh, about it because it's not taking into account the identities of the actors. And I'm like, the, yes, I, there's a way to do it. Yeah. But you have to think about it. Um, Angela Davis uh, refers to it as color, being color evasive. And we, we mm. actually don't want to be because so right. I've often sometimes shifted away from that. I, I think artistically as well, because yeah, the audience does see that the audience, yeah. we understand like, if you're doing Fight Club, you put me on stage and it's like, I, who most likely you're going to, he's going to work as the Norton character, probably less so than the Pitt character. We're right. asking the audience a lot. We, we do that all the time, right? right. And, um, you know, but something that I've always, about being seen pops out because, um, you know, Woody Allen had famously, he does a New York where, Black people don't exist, queer people don't exist. And there's right. one point he was writing about how, well, you know, I'd love to, but these, you know, my stories don't fit. You get the idea that he's saying of like, he didn't imagine me in those world of right. academics talking about show, which is what I do. But I was like, oh, right. I, I'm not a gangbanger or something. So you can't see that. Mm -hmm. And it was on the right. same time that there was a TV show, um, The Good Place, where, mm -hmm. um, what stands out was that casting. Like, so with the actor is yes. cheating. It's like, oh, finally, my black nerd, myself yes. is there, which 10 years ago, 20 years ago, he would not yeah. have been in the room for 100%. that role because they would have said, no, we, this character is a nerdy professor type. That and doesn't that's, make sense. This is what we need. And the very English, full of herself lady is going to be, we're only going to see 
you know, you know, white actors for that. Yeah. And we're only going yeah. to, and for like a surfer dude, bro, from Florida, we're only going to see like white guys who yeah. don't care or whatever. Instead, they really cast and it all worked. Yes. Because well, we're all in those things. Yeah. Yeah. It's believable because it exists. <laughs> um, and doing more of that, I think, is exciting. And I, it, it's something I've always enjoyed being able to do because it's sort of, I don't want to be involved in something artistically that is, oh, well, we're, we're actually providing less work for, we're not being diverse. We're not being, you know, yeah. and so there must be some ways to give opportunities for um, as many folks as possible. And as you say, approaching a canon that's already been written because mm -hmm. that's the thing that says, oh, write your own stories or write your whatever. But it's like, well, there's a whole history of stuff that's been out there. It's very hard to mount things that people don't already know. Um, what you had said also though about the judge and, and the characters, um, I remember when they did a all black version of Streetcar Named Desire mm -hmm. and there was an intense, and even from friends, that, you know, friends of mine who were, I would say blind to that themselves. They were just, oh my God, he was so brutal. He was horrible. He raped that woman. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. In ways of like, well, wait a minute. You were like, I, we watched the, we watched the right, brand new version cool together. <laughs> you were like drooling over Ew. Marlon Brando. And right. but, I mean, right. it, right. they just weren't connecting because, well, and, you know, in fairness, I think certain further adaptations make it very clear what Stanley Kowalski is doing and how he's a predator right. and how he's dangerous. But right. as you're saying, when you're going to, first time you're going to really lean into the fact that he's terrible and really have the lighting yes. and everything really make it clear that he's raping and destroying this woman and it's right. a black right. guy. Uh, <laughs> you want to be kind of careful again, about it. Like, yeah, you just have to, like, it's, you know, Again, I, I don't think that it is impossible, but I don't think that you can approach it in the like, racism is over. Sexism and homophobia, it's over. We did it. We're fine. Like, I mean, it, even if we have and our audiences, because of what we do, tend to be fairly liberal and f tend to be fairly queer and fairly diverse, they still are walking in with biases that they might like you said, just said, like not even fully understand how deep they are. And even if they like intellectually know that is wrong, it is still something that, you know, they were raised in this country. <laughs> and that is what we have all been conditioned to see and interpret things as. So I think that it is, I mean, I think um, the fifth Avenue, I didn't, I haven't, I didn't see it. Cause I think I just moved here or something, but the fifth Avenue did a production of Oklahoma wherein the ca the main cast was all white with the exception of Judd. Mm. And I'm like, oh! <laughs> and that, when Curly comes in and tells Judd to hang himself so he will leave his white girlfriend alone, yeah, that is a different freaking story and i'm sure that the actor playing judd was brilliant and i'm sure on his own merits but and you could say well it's color i'm like it's not it's no. not that is a visceral in that time period <laughs> that is well, a visceral thing you are having them do on the fifth avenue stage and to act like what they're just people no <laughs> no. now our world we see we do see race we do see Mm -hmm. We're a very look at society and being aware of that is important artistically, sort of ignoring yeah. that can often make almost sort of, as I say, I don't want to do Ron DeSantis's work for him and say, hey, look, <laughs> I mean, the, really? uh, you know, there was oh no, God. back in the 50s, no one had a problem with an interracial couple in the South. Really? Like, I don't think so. Oh, and, you know, uh, it's not like, in the we, history books because we don't. Have it. <laughs> yeah, like oh my god. Martin Luther King had to do a lot of work. We don't give holidays <laughs> for, for for nothing, right? That's so that's what like, I yeah, hear. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that it's just like it, you know, and I get that because no one want people want to be able to oh let's put on our Victorian clothing and imagine mm -hmm. that the a, a a king could be black or a sure. European opera, even though. Well, a lot of that stuff is inherently white supremacist at its core. Mm -hmm. 
you know so um but back to to reboot and and what you're doing and examining this canon um months ago we've been talking about this because you were about to do um a work that i'm very i have always enjoyed rocky horror highly loaded but yes. there were some some challenges <laughs> you experienced with that can you uh, as you're comfortable with describe what that experience was yeah absolutely so um so this was in uh, this was going to be our second uh, our second production that we um had done coming out of the pandemic um so and the show that we had done previously was cabaret which is a very dark show um and i was like all right i want to direct something and i want it to be funny and i want it to be light and I want to have a good time because we had just done this like really dark deep piece. So I was like, all right, let's do something ridiculous. And the pitch was let's do the Rocky Horror Picture Show and let's set it at Hogwarts. <laughs> so <laughs> also very, I'm sure very aware of the oh yeah. In oh, a, in a absolutely issues absolutely with, on um, purpose because JK I Rowling. thought there is no better way for me to thumb my nose at J.K. Rowling and her transphobic turf nonsense than to essentially gay up her franchise. Of course, it was at a, quote, wizarding school. And there was a, you know, like, you know, she hasn't copyright scars on people's foreheads or, you know, glasses or wizards or any of those things. So we certainly weren't going to say it was the world of Harry Potter, but we were going to lampoon it in the great tradition of Mel Brooks and how Mel Brooks, you know, essentially humiliates Hitler. And, you know, there are now, you know, there are ways to do it well and ways to do it bad but i'd like to think i have an excellent sense of humor and i understand where the pitfalls are and i was like yeah i'm just going to mock the ever-loving hell out of it and the reason why um one because i wanted to at one point i was <laughs> um, i had all these ideas man um i was gonna have someone dressed up as jk and like come on stage and we were gonna pie her a la anita bryant i mean we were gonna just go for it Bully. Um, Frankenfooter was going to be Voldemort. I was like, a sexy Frankenfooter Voldemort to me is funny and it's drag and drag is political. And, and you know, again, and I, I use Mel Groves like I am Jewish and like there is something very Jewish about like using humor to get through pain. And the reason why, um, a couple of things. Um, so there are a lot of queer people who were growing up when Harry Potter was coming out, who loved that franchise. I know many yeah. trans and queer people who have tattoos on their body of, you know, referencing Harry oh, Potter. Absolutely. And we didn't know she was awful. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's genre. It's not even like you're kind of in something, right. like something outside, yeah. but it's like genre and fantasy yes. for the nerds and the uh, oh marginalized. That's our jam, right? Absolutely. Like that was- it wasn't, and you know. You know what I mean? And like, yes, there were like weird anti-Semitism things in there. And yes, there was, as you point out, there was like a black kid. <laughs> what <laughs> black any... person? Or right. that Chinese person who's like, I'm bored. Yeah, with name. A, whose name was Cho Chang. Like, for I, Christ can't, I, I can't come Whoa. up with a name. <laughs> I'm oh, bored. Right? Like, I... I don't know. What do they say? I mean, it was, it's, you know, again, she was not without her flaws. But... And it's not like she was a paragon of virtue. And then all of a sudden she fell. But you know what? If we didn't, every all material is problematic okay exactly we just thought she was human but she's like has a political issue an agenda of doing harm towards yes, trans no. people right now that's sort of now vicious. A monster. and it's shocking it'll be like oh well actually trans people are deaf eaters what like yes, that's not you, okay. where, where did that come from so no, she has jumped a are... bigot shark so hard that you it is oh, like i i you know, the Harry Potter series was never like my favorite. And I like, I never became obsessed at the deep end of fandom, but I loved those books. I enjoyed those books. I looked forward to my children reading them. And now I can't, I can't even enjoy them because I can't stop thinking about it. I mean, it, this is like, I mean, this is a whole other road. I don't get back yes. to this, of, of like, can you, you know, the death of the writer or death of the author. In any case, my point was, all right, 
to people of a certain generation and same with Rocky. Rocky is not, you know, when you look at it in today's lens, woof. <laughs> There's a lot of problems in it. And what does Reboot do best except to take things and say, all right, if I change the context around these things, can we watch them? And can we still learn something? And can we still see the story? So I was like, great. And perhaps it was ambitious to be like, yeah, I'm taking Rocky and Harry and we're going on a walk. <laughs> and I thought I could. And I really thought it out. I had like, I was like, okay, here are all the issues. Here's how we, you know, this and this and this. I was not going to buy Harry Potter merchandise. So she wasn't going to get any money from it. And I thought like, you know, we could, every show that Reboot does, we were, um, we pick a social cause. And I'm like, we could pick a like trans advocacy group from her hometown and give <laughs> them money in the, you know, in the name of this parody. Like, eh, eh. like we were really, I, I really wanted to like make that the focus. And I was very, very, very um, transparent about that because understandably when you see harry potter the first thing now that the queer community has to do is go who is doing this and what are you doing and do you know that jk is da, da, da. so i really wanted to be upfront with it so that everyone who wanted to be a part of this project was very aware um and similarly with rocky rocky was a lot of queer people's first exposure to queer art whether or not it is perfect by today's standards is irrelevant you could go to a midnight showing of Rocky and dress and act however you wanted in quote public in a, you know, in a movie theater mm -hmm. and no one did anything to you. No, like Absolutely. that was a sanctioned place for you to do that. We didn't have the owl house. <laughs> we didn't have Steven universe. We didn't have any of that. We had Rocky horror picture show. And a kid who a, a kid who had to hide in a closet because of who he was, and then learn that he was actually part of this magical, beautiful community who accepted and loved him. I can't imagine why queer people flock to that. Duh. Right? We didn't have any of those things. We didn't have much. So that's why I picked those things. And it was like, this is gonna be a catharsis for people who used these, you know, franchises as representation whenever you know when that was all they had okay that was always my thesis that is what i wanted to do with it i had a lot of other cool ideas it, that's my opinion and what happened was i got some blowback from the local um from some local trans artists who were like how you know you know how dare you do this because um these are really problematic and these are harmful to trans women and you are not a trans woman and therefore you should not be allowed to quote absolve or take back these franchises and my reaction was um i'm not trying to absolve anybody what jk mm -hmm. rowling is doing is inexcusable and unabsolvable because she even if today she woke up and was like oh my god i've made a terrible mistake she would have so much repentance to do and work to do to undo the horrible damage that she has done. Um, it, it like she, you know, and me doing this production would not help her do that. Um, but so, you know, that's one, I'm not absolving anyone. And two, like I, you know, I, it was so early in the pre-production, I actually didn't even have my full design team yet. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna direct it. I had a non-binary um, associate director. I had a non-binary set designer. I had a non-binary stage manager and we were just about to do auditions and that was it. So I might've had trans women on my team, but I hadn't gotten that far. And But the fact that a trans woman was not helming it um, made every, made this group who we got into it in our private uh, Seattle trans theater artist group. Um, it made them upset and very mm. nervous. And it was a very contentious conversation because even though, again, I was able to explain it, um, it is also worth noting that all of the people minus one were um, at least a generation younger than me. Um, I'm in, I'm 38 and they are mostly Gen Z people who, again, mm grew up also grew up with the internet which i did not i'm like one of the last generations where like i didn't have a computer until you know <laughs> till i was i think in middle school 
Um, and I, we didn't really have the free internet college, in school, right? And it was <laughs> sophomore year of college, they didn't have, and it was it was a razor. I thought it was very cool. Um, that was like, yeah, Motorola's a razor. So point being, like, I'm one of the last generations where, like, my last bit, I I didn't grow up with resources or with language. And they were really upset by this. They thought like the, that these franchises should be left to dust and that there was no amount of redeeming and no amount of rebooting that could be done. And if there were, it was not for me to do. Is that specifically for Rowling or Rocky or both that they were? Both, but mostly Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, but Rowling has said some, I, the damage to me does not seem exclusive. I'm obviously with this male peer, but exclusive to trans women because she's taken this perception of like poor, poor women who are being mm-hmm. t- convinced that they are mm-hmm. not beautiful, wonderful women and are being butchered. And rid- so it seems like if you're trans in general, it's kind of so it feels like yep. don't divide us because she's coming right. after all, all of us here. Um, but yeah, I mean the the with Rocky that was that's also interesting because I've seen folks who um have claimed that it is a trans like Frankenfurter yeah, is a trans, trans woman, woman, which I don't which agree it's with. Not, yeah, I don't. I meant to ask you that as well because I just don't yeah. see that in the text. That is, yeah. it's and in fact that it were. I mean, I know Laverne Cox was cast. Sure. And she was wonderful. It was great. I mean, yeah. I think, but for for me, it's always been that sort of spin on he is a man. He presents as a man because he, the only difference is like the appearance and sort of his kind of comfort in assuming all these things and a sort of yeah. the history of the of the gay villain of the European villain mm. of the period of, had started in the forties or the fifties. So mm-hmm. that the shorthand you get the all American male Brad, guy yeah. yeah and the villain in those uh thrillers and action movies is of course right. english and slightly fey and so forth right. and emasculating yeah and rocky flips that um on say okay, okay all right fine the gay villain is going to be wearing a dress um but totally in control you're going to prefer the villain mm-hmm. to the hero and sort of dominate so mm-hmm. That I found interesting, but it, yes, it's it's complex because the character is a villain, given that he's a mm-hmm. cannib- a rapist and a cannibal, um, yeah. but also has some great songs. And that's always right. Tough, and right? it's also <laughs> like if you were sexually awakened by Tim Curry as Frankenfurter, I don't know. I like, <laughs> I, like it. It regardless of your sexual orientation, like if something inside you didn't go. Hmm. Like, I don't know. I <laughs> so, Well, yeah, wanting to be him is what's dangerous. Similar with Prince, right? So it's not about yes, yes, wanting absolutely. to, like, it's just that, oh, he's so cool. And I feel like yeah. that is what a lot of people find dangerous. Yes. So it's not just, I want to, sex with it's that this person is someone is so cool even wearing a dress. I could be cool and dominant and powerful wearing mm-hmm. a dress as opposed to being, you know, a, either a damsel in distress or right. just something. I, he's completely in control like who doesn't want the leather jacket Absolutely. look that's my favorite that. frank look is the leather jacket I love, yes. <laughs> I love it no I, so yes so i i mean this was another thing that they discussed they're like this is you know uh, uh uh one of the charges was that because of rocky horror people are afraid of trans women and i'm like i i just don't think that that is true i mean like I, first of all there are a lot of reasons um, and yes, are there people who see Rocky Horror and they are frightened of it? Sure. I'm sure there are. I'm sure mm-hmm. there are people who see the birdcage and are frightened by it because it's two gay men in there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that like, uh, yeah. So to me, uh, I, I just disagree with that interpretation. I don't yeah. think, that, you know, and, and, and sure. Frank and Furter could be a trans woman who is fine with he, him pronouns. Like, I don't think that that interpretation necessarily is wrong. I just don't think that that not doing that is wrong. I think that Frank could be a gender fluid person. I think Frank could be like you could be a straight cis man who does that. And you know what? That's fine. 
That's literally yeah. fine. That makes no difference. And like I think any that, interpretation yeah. works. Um, exactly. And it is and it's, that is the power of Rocky. It's like we don't get it. Yeah. I mean, you know, Frank's at least, you know, like yeah. So yeah, like I mean, I, uh, I when think I was growing up, it was sort of if you were in the club, like if you were in the right, you liked Frank. I don't know who was. It's not. Uh, you know, my own experience here, but it wasn't like, say, Signs of the Lambs or worse so, um, right. Ace, Ace Ventura right. or right. even Soap yeah. Dish, which I love Soap Dish because I'm a big Soap Opera fan. I love things about that, but it has the very bad ending where uh, a trans woman is outed and that's yeah. how it's supposed to, oh, right, we've, hum we've humiliated her and right. now that's the, the end of the film. Hooray. Um, but Frank is not like literally the whole audience is meant to feel sad that Frank is dead at the end. Yes. But Frank is despite all the awful things he does. Everyone who sees that likes the guy um, yes. in spite of themselves or whatever, probably because I mean, Tim Curry is so great in it. So uh, yeah, I, I, I don't Absolutely. agree with that, but I, you know, look, I, there are people who have issues with black exploitation films or whatever. And I'm yeah. sure yes. if I said, Hey, Jasmine, because I'd always want to work feel on something. Hey, let's do a version of a black exploitation thing. That'd be awesome and do whatever. And people, but here's my take on it. And everyone's like, well, yeah. no, no. Here's our very modern take on right. things that I think. And it's different. I mean, some of that is different maybe for good ways because they have grown up in a, a culture where, you know, it isn't like the days of the celluloid closet, right? Where it's kind of like the the queerness that you actually saw was so understated. So you're kind of right. looking at these things and, oh, that's so cool. That was in the nest that it was here. Even if you're not queer, you liked that it was sort of appealing to being different or marginalized. Because that was often, yes. if you're different, the different character was, was queer. So if you're just it. a straight kid who, like myself, is getting, you know, that, likes things that people aren't supposed to like, like musicals and yeah. comics, because mm -hmm. I grew up way before the MCU. So that was right. not the cool yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, hey, Iron Man, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, no one's like, no one's into that <laughs> but me. So, um, uh, but the queer kid was the, the cool, because those were the queer character, the queer person who was, was different was something you found appealing yeah, um, absolutely. You know, but that's unfortunate because I think it would have been so exciting to have seen what I you've know. done with it. And I mean, it's sort of a great thing to do. And also people are going to do these things. And I'm going to be very angry when someone does this. And it's going to be a, it's going to be some straight white guy I, who's going to well, do see, this exact idea. Understand. And he's going to get a like, Tony. <laughs> Honestly, like it was in because I mean, basically um, for for the listener, um, we ended up canceling the show because there was such outcry. And specifically, there are a couple of people who have um, a very hefty social media following. And they basically had they eventually the conversation got uh, uh, got uh, 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 driven toward a call to action, which is like, if you do this, we will shut you down. And I was like, I we are a volunteer board a working board. We do not have a staff. We do not pay our act. Like we pay everyone like a, you know, a couple hundred dollars stipend and, you know, we are coming out of a pandemic and we are still like figuring, you know, re-remembering how to make theater. And um, we don't, if they decide to do this and they try to take us down, we do not have the ability to um, like yeah. to, to take that challenge. So we canceled the show. Um, and I, and I was, you know, it was really painful because I felt like I was, you know, it, it, it was painful to be called out like that by my own community, especially because, you know, considering all of the work that I have done, um, for and with my community. And I was like, wow, I really haven't earned the trust to do this project that yes, is controversial and will be hard. Um, but I guess you don't, I, I'm not trusted enough to do that. And that was a really painful thing for me. Um, but also, you know. Truly, what also made me angry is like there were productions, two productions of Hedwig, there were productions of Kinky Boots, and there was also a, an actual production of Rocky that were all being done in the area at the time. And I'm like, so you're not going after all of the cis, probably white, I didn't look into every single one, 
production, like run and leadership productions of these queer stories who are going to have no new interpretation at all and are going to do it exactly as it has always been done with no like real synthesis. But you're going to come after the one trans led organization whose entire mission is to literally, you know, it, reinterpret and recontextualize these stories. That's who you're going to shut down. And I don't think any of them should be shut down. I mean, no. people are allowed to do bad versions of shows if they want. And I I'm not that, saying yeah. that every show we do is going to work, but I, that was really, that was very disappointing to me. And yeah. yeah so, you know, that really, that really sucks. I, you know, I have never, I've never personally had patience for when like the, the bad stand up comic is just like, Oh, woe is me. If anyone right. writes a bad review of my, boring transphobic comedy routine mm. I, can, I can't do art just like well no <laughs> i mean people get bad reviews that's what happens i yeah. am someone who writes i also do a lot of theater criticism so i think sure. you were never someone who was like yeah like if if it sucked tell me it sucks and it and the show might not be successful and just yeah. let me have it that's the art but to me that's very different from shutting down and i've never Again, the worst person, the worst, and I will never shut them down as saying, this is okay. If you ask me to review this, I'm going to say it's not very good. And here's why. But I just don't feel a need to, shutting it down means like we want to silence this conversation or silence mm -hmm. your ability to do this. Um, and that just seemed, you know, to me, uncool. I, I don't want to, I'm sure their motivation, I don't want to necessarily question their motivations for people who feel like this is perhaps going to do them them harm but sure. i don't know i mean with satire again we go back to mill brooks and we go back mm -hmm. to blazing saddles and these are things where yeah it's not about because usually annoying people say oh why can't we do blazing saddle well, no actually blazing saddles is incredibly woke because it's about oh you know and um and that is how he he's his work it's so fascinating because i grew up at a time mm -hmm. where yeah know, you kind of look down at Mel Brooks and now you later it's like oh wow this stuff's far headier than any of the oh, up in my I, up in my ass stuff about watching yeah. Annie Hall in Manhattan it's like oh this is theater this is right. art, you know movies and art and cinema mm -hmm. and it's like oh well, no no this actually places saddles is very daring oh, and, experiences. and um so um yeah that that really that's unfortunate um so you and I had worked together a couple of years ago um yes. at Cafe Norido um, in Seattle on um, Curiouser and Curiouser, a uh, version of the Alice in Wonderland stories that co-adapted. And I've been working with uh, Aaron and Terry, the artist directors there, before, um, right before things shut down in um, April of 2020. We had a big ambitions for the show. And then the world ended. And then the world was slowly coming back, summer of 2021. You were brought in to direct. And before, I, before um, what's interesting <laughs> here is um, often when I usually connect with people, one big way is, and I don't know why I never brought this up to you at the time. I think it was because I assumed, because you're somewhat younger than I am, I would not have mentioned to you a show called Cop Rock, because that was informative, <laughs> which uh, starred, I later learned, a, a gentleman named Larry Joshua. Yes, this, uh, I know him well. Yeah, your father. <laughs> you would not have been. I was in high school at the time, and so I would have clarified. Yeah. The Cop Rocks a show musical with cops. It's, you know, and we've since had shows like Glee or things that. Yep. But these yep. are these are cops singing and dancing, and I remember sixteen year old <laughs> me. This Such is, a so weird you, show. So you can understand, of course, what Stephen Robinson's life was growing up as a oh my God. black kid in the Bible Belt. <laughs> And all I want to do is talk about cop rock. And my theory at the time, me. this I saw the I've just seen the best show on television. I, that was what I told it, and, and I presume that every TV show now will be shut down, and will come back Make in a couple room. weeks as a musical. <laughs> every TV show, Star Trek: Next Generation, uh, a musical will be back. Yes. A musical, Law, Law and Order. Mm -hmm be a musical everything is going to now be a musical because of this show so uh, but uh i did never i i'd see that in your bio i was like i i that was usually my thing of god because that was something when working with people i've always like can we make this more like a musical and i always go back to because ever since i saw cop rock i was like no no everything must be like a mute like this is what everything should be 
It was before I... its time. <laughs> <laughs> Very so. Um, uh, so yeah. So you were brought on. You were directing the show um, with so many great, fun ideas. And but you know, we, as you were saying, learning yeah. to rediscover theater mm-hmm. and how to do it, how to do it safely. Can you just tell us a little about the experience, like? like how terrifying it might have been or <laughs> trying to oh, yeah. yeah yeah so um for myself like i um i call myself an arch shark because if i stop i will die so i just keep i like i just i'm always like you know i was always moving always going and my life was so ch- this is pre pandemic i was so overbooked and overblast like just the whole you know shows on top of shows on top of shows, sometimes almost literally. So the shutdown, you know, forced a stop in habit, good and bad. And so, you know, and I'm not the only one, certainly. So me coming back in and, you know, like I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I produce. So like I had a lot of different wings that I was mm-hmm. always go- moving on in many, in, in, in many capacities. So to re-enter the ring, <laughs> um, especially for, um, you know, a musical or a show with music, like, you know, it was on that line, especially for dinner theater. So it was like literally two of the most dangerous ways <laughs> to do theater, which they were like, yeah, singing is like the most contagious thing you can do. And obviously, you know, you're with audience members who are eating which means they're not wearing a mask and Nordo is very immersive. So it's not like they're across the hall. No, no, they're right there. They're right in there. And so this was a very like, you know, I'll say dangerous. And I don't mean it in the sense that like Nordo was like, I don't care, do it. But I mean, the sense that like, we all knew the risks walking in. We were like, all right, like (laughs) um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try this out. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, it turned out to be one of the like most longest running shows <laughs> in Seattle. Um, cause it kept going even after I left the show. Um, but in any case, so that was all the pretext coming into it. And I think once we got there, the things that, you know, I was saying to, you know, Terry, uh, and, uh, Aaron, who were the producers and Terry was also a co-writer was that, you know, no one knows where everyone is because you know people haven't been practicing you know i don't know if actors are going to be able to memorize at the speed they used to be able to Mm -hmm. i don't know if like you know people you know like designers are going to be like yeah god i used to have a system for doing this and now i don't um now i like or i don't remember it or uh, i like i used to know where all the stuff is but we had to move things so like a lot of that is like catching up with the skills that you have because when you Mm -hmm. you know it's like, I mean, it's a language, right? Theater is a language. And when you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? And, you know, sometimes you, and sometimes it's like riding a back bike and you get back on, but I wasn't, no one knew that. So that was like a lot of the uncertainty. And the other part of it was like, we were in this new world of Zoom where like we would have a, a computer in the room and we had to figure out like, okay, because all the understudies, we did, wanted to minimize the amount of people in the room in terms of exposure. The first vaccine had come out. But that was it. I don't even think we had a booster yet. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and it was six months after the first vaccine came out. So there was a question of like, is this still working? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so we wanted to minimize. We had, you know, understudies on Zoom. And the understudies, because of, you know, the, the, the stage was set up in this like alley. They had to see the entirety of the stage so that they could know what their blocking was. So like part of that, part of my job then became also like, okay, what is the best angle <laughs> for these cameras so that these actors can do their job? Um, and so I think like a lot of that and, you know, the actors themselves, like, I mean, and then, you know, I was also an actor during, I am an actor still during the pandemic and like, that's its own thing. But as a director, because part of your job is to make sure that your room is conducive to everyone being able to do their job. There were a lot more considerations (laughs) than there used to be. And some of them we figured out as we were going. And I was really lucky in the sense that, you know, our producers were really 
kind and our writers were really kind and the actors were really kind and there really wasn't anyone who was like this is unacceptable i can't work like no and honestly if they had said that we would have been like you're right <laughs> we don't have that. you know like but everyone was game everyone was very like okay this is crazy but we're gonna do it and i think uh, you know we were really lucky because there were so many it, it was an old habit that was all brand new you know Yes. And we were doing two different, sh two shows simultaneously. Yes. That had been the plan yeah. prior to it, but it was going to be one long night. So we would right. start downstairs and venture up. We would be, uh, Terry and Aaron and I would joke because we had ideas of like, oh, and then we'll grab strangers and cram them in the jury box. Like whatever, yeah. and everything we looked at, oh, right. We, all of these ideas are insane now. Like that <laughs> stuff that had been normal. Right. You know, right. like, Right, that seemed perfectly normal before now in the new times that we were trying to figure out how to make this work. So we wound up doing them simultaneously with That's a right. much smaller cast that you were juggling with because, you know, we're trying to minimize exposure, minimize exposure in dressing rooms. And so uh, our Alice is going back and forth. Oh my and gosh. I was trying to write around that as well. So we would be, yeah. which is a part of in the, that craziness was the fun because I remember- I think so. One of the last things I wrote uh, was really you're saying, oh, Stephen, we have like eight minutes yeah. <laughs> without we Alice. Yeah, this time for the scene upstairs, yeah. Yeah, and that wound up being one of my favorite scenes downstairs, which actually led to, I think, um, A Sweet Dreams number, which everyone loved. When they, oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, so, uh, um, yeah. It's so, um, you know, and that's what I'd missed. Because, you know, as you were saying, I was still I was still writing. Of course, I was writing political stuff right. during the worst time in the world. So I was slowly going insane, not leaving the house sure. and just writing about everyday plague and racial unrest. And, um, you know, later an attempted overthrow of the government. It was not a fun you time. Know. And I always said, like, right. I needed to always balance. I need to be able to do that, but then also yeah. do some fun stuff or at least a different way at looking at the political world. Because I think my... Right creative writing is also political in itself, but in a different way. So this was wonderful that collaborative nature, solving problems was yes. fun. And you were a yeah. great person to do that with. As a director, I just want to say Jasmine's a wonderful director and great with Thank working you. with people and with great ideas. And you said before, but you really do have a great sense of humor of like getting the sense of how we were going to get us on its legs to be funny, to find yes. a sort of yes. approach to it. Yeah, it was so, yeah, so, so uh, that's right. So like on top of like the pandemic, the dinner theater aspect, the singing aspect, there was also like, yes, there were, there were actors. So the, 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 this space has two playing spaces. So the actors were running up and down the stairs because sometimes they were in a scene upstairs and then they would have to be in a scene downstairs as a completely different character and a completely different story. And the only character which... <laughs> In retrospect, I feel like if I, I, I feel like having the same Alice was a made sense when the, when, but when the, when the audience was one audience going from mm -hmm. one to the other, because she would be the main, you know, she was the, uh, um, the fulcrum, like everyone could follow Alice and knew who Alice was. So if different actors were playing different characters, you're like, yeah, yeah. Like I accept that. But Alice was like your person you could follow. And the thing that I was always kind of sad about is that, you know, the actor playing Alice, she did such an incredible job because she was in both plays at the same time, constantly. A scene upstairs, a scene downstairs, a scene upstairs, a scene downstairs, two scenes downstairs, one scene upstairs. But the audience never knew that. Like we had no. to tell them. And I wish that there had been a way. <laughs> to tell them she's not she's not like having a break like alice right. is smoking a cigarette in the corner she actually no, is she in every scene at once it was what and it was such a cool idea because again like you know when you think about like again in the before times when you're like how can we do more and how can we stretch this like this is the show that you wanted to do that with and we into it was such an ambitious show to do like oh, yeah. right out of the gate and uh, like you know had we had more like brain space or had we been able to do some of the original ideas i think that like that i wish that we had had a way to show the audience like do you Absolutely. see the insanity she's, of what we're doing what she's doing the uh the sidebar to that because some uh when adapting um books to the stage and i've worked mm -hmm. with book it as well yeah. i often will tell people like okay you know um 
this character in your book, like Nick Carraway's in the whole thing. But if you put that on stage, now you're telling an actor, like if you watch a play, something that's been developed, you, <laughs> yeah, you don't, <laughs> we usually don't do that. But in books you do, it's like, oh yeah, so our main character will be in every scene, every stage. Right. But like on original play, you would never do that because your actor would be like, oh, screw you. Like I can't. <laughs> can't remember yeah. i've got i'm on stage every minute and i've got oh my god and that's one of the biggest challenges i found when adapting to is how to resolve that in a way and we were even before the before times trying to figure a way to like okay can the red queen banish alice for right. a while she's not on stage for a bit right. um the so um <laughs> speaking of the red queen and uh, another uh, family reference because you're um mother uh mm -hmm. was falling on edge of night she had, mm -hmm. uh, and um she was <laughs> i've always been inspired by the great um soap opera villains of oh, all man. time like everything so if you read most, most of the stuff i write there's a <laughs> there's a track of that this you know it's such a genre in itself of the great oh so man there's so, these women having so much fun and dominating yes. I'd always like to say, just sort of the housewives at home in the old days watching this and being like, oh, right. Yeah, I wanna, get him. <laughs> I, I want to be able to do this. Drag so, her. Yes. Yeah, so that had been certainly um, an influence in my uh, work as well. Of, oh, um, absolutely. The Red Queen, if ever there was a soap opera. Very <laughs> nice. I just love to be just brand, just Perfect. sort of a broadness or whatever. And uh, Katrina oh, has. So good. Katrina Hess, who is a wonderful costume designer in uh, Seattle, oh. but her outfits are just before the Red Queen. God, unworldly. The Queen of Hearts are just unworthy. I mean, that's always sort of this type of, I was like, what type of theater writing do you want to do? Someone has said, and I was like, just stuff that K Katrina Hess could go crazy on. Oh. So like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want it to be someone dressed like me. I want to be right. something no, no. that just, I want to be justify the most outrageous stuff. We're in Wonderland. Wonder exactly. So uh, that's the kind of work that always appeals to me. But yeah, the logistics of that was just um, mm. you you really were a champ with it and got <laughs> it to where it opened. Um, I think for everyone who works in theater, um, the Shakespeare in Love is has at least yes. one line that appeals oh, to us. It was just like, how will it all work out? It's a mystery. <laughs> but that I mean, is really. the miracle of it. You're like, there's usually, I've said before, there's every moment it'll be like some point, even in tech, you're like, okay, oh well, <laughs> this isn't gonna work. Everything I wrote is terrible. My, I can't let my wife see this. If you leave <laughs> and take my kid away from me. Yes, you know what? There's a nice film happening at the end. You should just go and do that. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> and I think, you know, again, like if this, if this show had been done, like when we were, even if it was, even if we were doing it now that we have, we've, people who've been working have a little better of a grip even on like you know like one skills of this of of times past but also literally of like okay and this is how we do things now this is like the process for like you know because we were like do we sanitize every prop like it, does it touch and oh, yeah. like, you know what i mean like all of those things like we were figuring out i mean norda was one of the first theaters to do anything at all in person so we couldn't even call up someone else and be like so how did you like there weren't really no, you know, people were still kind of figuring it out and making mistakes. And, you yeah. know, I mean, but you know, it were, I mean, it your, did. You, you, <laughs> I it was, I, you know, I say like, again, as someone who's always freaking out right before thing goes on, I'm like, Oh my God, everything I did was terrible. Like this was, for, I was first time I've wa been something of like, Oh my God, this is really good. Like even the like yeah. dress rehearsals or whatever. And you had talked about folks not having worked in a while. I mean, these are, they were spot on of their line. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just like, oh my God, this is so, and I think perhaps it was because everyone really wanted this to work. We really, yes. all of us wanted this to be back and to make something that yes. would, would be fun. And, you know, I think the Nordo Theater experience was part of that. I had some friends mm -hmm. who came to see it and they were just like, it was their first time also out, first time out uh -huh. seeing friends. That's right. that's and so right. they really, they still talk about that experience oh, because that's the so joke. Because it's such a great experience. I mean, part yes. of it, like, I had folks who were kind of like, well, I don't want to necessarily sit in a dark room and stare at a screen, you know, stare right. at a stage because I haven't, when I'm going out again, I want to just, we sort of discovered in a weird way. And I think it goes back to the type of stuff I like to do. I feel like immersive was always the key because that's kind of what mm. people, I feel like we want to be able to connect with people and yes. be part of this community and share it. 
fully knowing we're sharing in this experience. And yes. so, um, I mean, I think that's what going back to Rocky, that was a piece that became an immersive theater thing. Yes, of its hey, own. that's it was right. A movie, and then people are coming and doing and forming these relationships. Creating, yes, like culture around, uh, you know, this thing, this like weird ass film that made no sense. <laughs> I mean, and, I mean, but really, like, and what is Rocky if not Wonderland? There are no rules. Mm -hmm. And when there are, they break. And that's fine. And we can do it backward. And now we're going to speak in a different way. I mean, like, that's, you know, I think, you know, it was such a great, you know, using Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> you know, was also such a great reentry because we had all been in this weird place. Oh, yeah. So long where nothing made sense and the rules changed at the whim of some rando tyrant i mean <laughs> you know so i think it, it like it it really was kind of a perfect re-entry even though it was like almost stupidly ambitious what we did and we did it because you know and again yeah all of those actors like all of the worries that we had going in like to some extent kind of everything that could go wrong like kind of did <laughs> but Everyone wanted it so bad and everyone had such grace. I think that was what I was trying to say before. There was such grace. Everyone was like, you know what? We're going to do it. And I think that what we gained from the pandemic, like the positive reflection that theater got to do, some more than others, is that, you know, this is an industry that is based off of, you know, overworking people for little pay and taking advantage. And if you are not willing to do that, it means you're not in it. And if you're... Oh, no weak as a, if you're a mortal ha this isn't an industry for mortals and i think that for me you know i mean this is how i approached cabaret certainly and this is how i approached this i was like you know what if it doesn't work we'll change it yeah and it's you know <laughs> and that's i think have that's the writers right here oh yeah and that's why i think i've i've myself i've never had patience with that sort of trope of actors or performers as divas or impatient yeah. that's, a, that's never been my experience i've always been the one of being like and we both like bits and actors and so yeah when someone does and it's like oh and a laugh doesn't go it's like oh yeah it's my fault how can i rewrite it but like every time if it's a line or a joke or a bit mm -hmm. the actors was like no 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 they will do everything possible to yes. make it work. Yes. And you have to be the one to say, no, 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 it's my fault. I <laughs> totally right. let me fix this. But otherwise they're just gonna have so much, you know, of they want wanting yes. it to, to Actors come Actors want you to laugh. Oh my God, there's nothing worse when you're like, I'm trying so hard. And of course the harder you try, the not fu uh, less funny it is. And there are different layers. I mean, that's why like, so like there's the actor and the actor's interpretation. Then you have, a, you know, me, my job is the director in the room. Like I did a lot of like, I don't know. Okay, then try something else. Or like if the actor was like, eh, is this what the joke is? Because, uh, you know, again, like the language of Alice in Wonderland, you did such a beautiful job bringing so much of the book into the play, which I think we don't really normally really see i think that we're just like yeah we generally know it and then you know especially when you think of like the disney cartoon like they use like some of the lyrics but it was like put into song or it was mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't have like the true like twisted weird stuff that is in this book and i love that these you know i was like even if you know alice in wonderland i bet you you don't know some of these kind of cool quirky things that are in it and i love that those were in it but it's weird poetry. It's very, it's very yeah. weird. And, uh, well, you know, one of the challenges, it's very much person walking into rake. So at first it's a style <laughs> of thing that's very tough for me of right. like, well, this is person walks to a rake and it goes and walks to a different rake. And that yes. was sort of how the books are structured because yes. they're mad. So trying to find some way of fix, you know, um, and, and I think we succeeded of just finding Absolutely. Oh, and, yeah. the, of making that work. Um, I think also, uh, the benefit of some of the, the actors. I mean, the the yes. um, going modern happened with the great actor, uh, Rebecca Court, of just having yes. such a, a hand on it. And I was immediately, yes. when she came in, and same with Jacqueline Medima, mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, we don't have to do English accent theater. They can That's do, right. they can take the approach this way. Um, and oh my God, the great bow. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. I mean, what a cast. I mean, really. Yeah. And I think Everest. a lot of it was like, we were all kind of like, all right, well, that didn't work. And before, I, and we always said like, okay, we we can go to the writers. Like you were always very open. Like, yeah, like let's talk about it. But I think that, you know, for me, the fun of being a director, and especially because I come, you know, 
from like this reboot culture that I'm like kind of creating as I go, which is like, cause I can't call the writers of the shows that I do and be like, can we change? Like, I don't, I can't change anything. I can't change pronouns. I can't change anything. Cause that's what, you know, it's published as such. And some of the writers are dead. So I can't, you know, even if I wanted to, I can't go to them. And so I'm like, okay, well, is there another way that like, how, like, let's see if we can fix it in the room first. And I would say that to the actors. I'm like, let's see if we can figure it out in the room. Because if we can, like, that's exciting. That's the work. And if mm -hmm. we can't, we happen, we are lucky enough that this is a new work. It's still being developed. And, we, you know, this is the first time anyone's ever seen it. And the writers may be like, uh, yeah, that doesn't work. Oh, I see. Yeah, we should move that. And, you know, that's, you know, as a writer is like such a gift too. It's like, oh, yeah, my head. <laughs> that was a different place. Whoops. Exactly. Um, yeah. It works. But once you get the, the reading and you get the collaboration, you know, get the syncs of. Um, but yeah, um, it was one actor, Bo. He was our approach to the White Rabbit changed completely. I was able oh to kind of go to a um, more of a cabaret feel for yes. downstairs that was just excellent. And that, that helped with the show. So it's just that benefit of being able to do something like that is always uh was so much fun and you know again appreciate your steering that ship during such troubled <laughs> waters this is like either either you're going to get to the americas or you're going to right just, like... or i guess this is yeah. <laughs> yeah. we just die here but i mean i don't know again like i i i, I am so great like i had a great time even though like yeah there were nights where i'm like i don't know i don't know if this is gonna work this might be a total disaster and you know i might like what if all these actors go out we didn't have like do we even have understudies i don't oh we did we did of course i just said that my brain um but i was like who like but we didn't have we didn't have one for one understudies which now we're seeing like other theaters have gotten burned by because if one character if one person is covering two characters and both those characters go out ooh, um and we had that happen yeah i think we actually had an understudy switch and learn someone else's part mid rehearsal because we were like, Ooh. Um, but it worked because again, everyone was so game and like, yeah, like Bo got to create this incredible, like white rabbit character, Jessica as the mad hatter downstairs. I mean, that like just became its own, like, Oh, so this is what we're okay. Okay. No, no, she wasn't the mad hatter. She was the um, March hair. March hair. March hair. Was Just Justine. Justine. Was, uh, Talk about re, I mean, what, I I was so sad because they remounted it um, like a couple months after the original run left and they m you moved some actors around and I didn't get to see, um, I think it was Jackie that played the March Hare or Jackie that played uh, the Mad Hatter afterward. Is that right? I think she briefly, she briefly did, but Justine was there for a bit of the, for a of bit of it. Run. And so of the second run for a good chunk of it and then came back. But we're so we were we did so long. It was like one of those things of just like such a gift. And I've always oh. wanted it to be of something that has run for a while where people come in and then come and back. And want to do the other show. I mean, that was what was I thought was that was the other thing that I thought was so cool is that you could come to see the same. I mean, like it, it's this quote, the same show in the sense like, yes, it is Alice who has to outsmart a queen and then, you know, find her way through the thing. But it was a completely different show. Each of the two. I mean, that I thought was such a brilliant on your part. Well, they, yeah. It, you um, just, I mean, it wasn't like, eh, it's the same show with different costumes. Like, it really let's was not. Try to make a different feel. Um, yes. A my, completely different feel. I, I, um, we had lost the upstairs, so we didn't, weren't able to do Feast, bring Feast of the Queens back. I would love to bring it back for a much Ugh. larger audience and to yes. give Rebecca and Jackie yes. kind of. They were doing wonderful. Again, you're talking like 20, having 25, 30 people in a house, just safe. It's tough because you're, yeah, you know, into, but to give them yes. more of an and audience would have been, would be wonderful. I would love to eventually at some point remount that. I, I think honestly, yes. For that. Even like to, even to have more like ability to do more tech of the like chess, they had this incredible chess battle. The two yes. Teams, and then Alice. And we were like, we're like, oh, like what can we do to like have this fight be dynamic and like the lights and the sound that we have did such a credible job with like that scary sound that the night. Yes. <laughs> well, that was, so yeah, we, all this stuff. And I'm going to discuss for a while because this is stuff that's like, 
well, we can't afford a red a red light. It's like, all right, right. Well, how will we do it? And Terry's like, maybe it'll be a tech gesture. And you and, and our lighting person came up with this wonderful spooky feel like for yeah. that. And um, and the 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 chess battle because again, yeah. we don't have okay. Well, we don't have Alice needs to go do another play. So <laughs> our lead needs to go do another play. <laughs> Which is normally what doesn't happen. Your lead right? doesn't go to do another play in the middle of your water play. off the wing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so we wound up doing this sort of queen, like, and again, one of the last things I'd written and I was able to work with you of like getting the pattern right of that yeah. battle. And audiences yeah. love seemed to love that. It was so much oh fun. Oh my god! Immer it was immersive, yes. and then there the fight and what you sort of built with that. It was so much, so much fun. So yes, we should definitely team I'm up. In. Yeah. Steal I mean, it. And like and do it such, again at some point in such contrast because downstairs like uh, you mentioned was like this cabaret space and i think that like downstairs got more rowdy because that was kind of the nature of that of that particular show because it was very like hey everybody like we're all here and we acknowledge you and like the other one was this queen's feast where like everyone like at any moment could be murdered by a queen <laughs> which was i mean such a different vibe and i think that also like again retraining audiences to be like it is okay to la like you are in front of a live person and you can laugh and you can be human and, you know, the other thing that I find hard also as an actor, you know, when you are in front of a masked audience is you can't read them as well. Mm -hmm. So as an actor, like you're trying to figure out, like, did you, do you like this? And can I like be in here a little bit longer or do I need to move on? Cause you're like, yeah, I'm done. And like, you know, the actors relearning that they did such a good job. They were so in tune because they knew these characters so well and they knew how they would move and they knew, you know, how they would react to different people. And it was, oh God, I like, I was really I, like, I'm still, I'm like really proud because <laughs> it was and, insane. And, but every oh. reason to be, it was great. And it was such a wonderful <laughs> experience of like, we brought back theater. Yes. <laughs> it's here. It's happening. And the weirdest kind of theater. Um, we didn't just do like, you know, <laughs> we didn't do something safe. And I think, you know, especially now, and, and there's really no shame in that. Like, I don't say that. I'd be like, yeah, all these boring people looking for money. Like, yeah, like we live in capitalism and art is hard in capitalism. And so like, I totally understand why it's like, yes, please let's bring back the Les Mis tour. <laughs> yes, I will need that money. Please let us do White Christmas at Christmas time because that yes. will sell and we need that. And there's no shame in that. Um, but it's like all the more remarkable that Norda was like, yeah, we're going to do a new work. We're going to do two new works. We're going to do two new works simultaneously. <laughs> We're going to do like, I mean, and it just kept stacking and it truly like we did, we brought it, we, you know, we rang it back in and it did very well. I mean, yeah, it was great. Well, and it it's great. so God. much, so much fun. And um, yeah. And working with you was, was great. And I walls that opened and art exhibits. <laughs> oh yes. The art exhibits audiences were just, stunned by that as well. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to immersive, the idea of being shocked, being something new. And I think that yes. was, that was in this weird way, what was safe. I think if you, mm. people got used after a couple mm. of years of sort of sitting at home and, yes. you know, I've been binge watching The Crown in my robe. Do I and need to actually, <laughs> yeah, do I need to leave the house to essentially go sit in a room again and watch yeah. something where there's no, yeah. here it's like, no, no, we're going to feed you. There's going to be stuff happening around you. There's yeah. interaction. There's going yes. to be stuff in a tactile. And I feel that's what I think even now, because the theater is suffering from a sense yeah. of it's not quite back to where it was. Even the yeah. safer stuff is not doing as well, because I think a lot of people are like, yeah, why? Why should I leave the house again? You know, yeah. I got so comfortable. And yeah. I think they're being relearned. And that is the key. And of course, exciting. Uh, we'll sort of wind up with the exciting work that you are doing. Is there anything right now that we should people should know about that you're working on right now that you can tell them about? Yeah. Um, so Reboot is doing Peter and the Star Catcher this fall. Um, and this, this show is a very, it, it, it's essentially, it's based on a book by Dave Barry and it's the uh, origin story of Peter Pan. So kind of, you know, uh, uh, again, back into like classic literature, like reimagined. And it's written kind of in the style of like 39 steps, if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. Which is like, you know, kind of vaudeville wacky 
Um, Roger Reese directed the, I think, uh, uh, the original work. And if you're familiar with Roger Reese, he's like this incredible physical actor. Or he was. Um, he passed, sadly. Um, yes, and, he's one of my fa I, I, oh, I, I quote him a lot. He was in Cheers. So I, I quote him. Oh, yes. Him. I mean, and for speaking of Mel Brooks, he was the sheriff in uh, uh, Men in Tights. Yeah. He did to kill a king's death. Uh, <laughs> brilliant just brilliant man um god rest him so um in any case like so it, it, you know we're going back into comedy and the director riley jean um is taking this and is kind of reinterpreting the story of uh, um so it's like how peter became peter pan and the protagonist in the show is molly who is kind of like a a wendy s character it's like a young woman being raised in victorian england and is kind of restricted by these gender roles of what it means to be a woman and i can i'm sure you already understand where we might be going with this um <laughs> and so we're really using the metaphor of like what does it mean to figure out who you are um and what does it mean to explore different parts of who you are and learn to fly and so like that's really whimsical and cute except which is great and affirming and beautiful and it's a comedy and it's going to be very funny and you know the captain hook character is a character named black stash who is you know in the great tradition of i think it, it takes the um the musical peter pan hook who is a uh, captain hook who's like a very theatrical like <laughs> kind of a guy and it it amps it so he's like a very you know charismatic full of himself dude so it's like it's just it's just funny and it's fun and you know we'll do our rebooty thing we're doing a very cool thing with um the tech of it i won't spoil it but it'll be great oh, that's and, awesome yeah so that's our that's next on our docket it's not that everything is a queer metaphor but it often does I seem mean, to be or for any sort of like you think of stories like peter pan or just any sort of someone that said everything is either alice in wonderland or wizard of oz right like right. one of that is essentially Yes. what this story either is. And so yes. about, it's like the idea of winding up someplace new and different and, ex and either being changed by it or coming, well, you know. And yeah. um, there's that sort of wistfulness often in mm -hmm. both of those of not having stayed, and like in, especially in right. Peter Pan, you get yes. to stay in a fascinating world and you got old and yeah. Uh, and so, um, no, that's exciting. That's a I've seen uh, productions of that as as well. It's a, a great story. Dave Barry is a columnist. Was a great influence of yes. mine when I oh, was uh, growing I up. And um, this was always one of those things of like, you mean the Dave Barry? It's like yes. I mean, it's funny, but it's also yes, a musical. It is does feel like a. It's, it's not like Steve, it's not like Stephen King wrote it, but it does feel like someone's like. <laughs> Although wait, boy, wouldn't that you would be that? <laughs> the Stephen King musical. Of the... Which one would you do? Which of his books would you turn into a musical? <laughs> I think only because uh, I can see cares. the theme of misery to, I, you know, like Weird <laughs> Al's I Lost on Jeopardy. I don't know why I'm thinking of misery, misery. <laughs> uh, it is misery. Yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it is um, it's interesting because you uh, have that sort of background in weird stuff give you know uh, i've always have that sort of kinship with folks who have that sense of and you take it and you make we also fun stuff with it so far <laughs> I, I, I mean i i love it i love i mean i love a bit i like i i mean actually no that's not i i have my coaster on my desk except it, i thought i was gonna say i love a bit because i had a couple phrases during uh curious and curiouser but one of the things that i said a lot the cast made me this coaster that just says all right let's run this bitch <laughs> <laughs> let's do it yes let's that go was my thing. like all right let's run it <laughs> like let's see if it works and you know we were like all right um but that but honestly let's see if it works is like truly my ethos like i think like let's see like i don't know it might not, <laughs> but we won't know. We well, won't know. yeah. Well, Reboot does great work, very important work, especially now uh, yeah. in, and everyone in the Seattle area or even on, in Portland where I am, because I get to Seattle quite often, go see a show at Reboot and uh, right. check out the great work from Jasmine Joshua. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for spending some time with us today. Well, yes, my pleasure. Anytime. Time.